So, you want to build a K-Bike? Please, have a seat and let Uncle Lily drop a load of exposition onto you, consistent of everything I learned about building K-Bikes over the course of about 13 months or so. You will be receiving your hipster sticker in the mail, because somehow we've reached a point where a single cam CB750 is just too mainstream. If you haven't watched the K-Bike history video, you should probably go watch that video as it gives a, a rundown on the, well, the history of the K-Line. I'm also making this video assuming that you have watched or you will watch my build series because it shows more than a few jobs and details that I'll describe here. So a bit of backstory on how I found myself building a K100. You might be surprised to learn that I had no intentions of building one. In fact, I had my eyes set on a Yamaha Virago, uh, two of them in fact, XV750 and XV920. But the rule of thumb for posting something on Craigslist is that you must immediately disappear into the void of space after you hit the post ad button because the first person didn't respond to my interest, the second person didn't respond, and then the second person responded after I decided screw it might as well go buy this weird old green BMW I see on here from Queens. So my bike is a 1986 K100 2-valve and you'll have to find out which bike you want to build because there's like so many different models with different displacements, fuel systems, and cylinder heads among other things. K-Bike line started with the K100 for the 1983 model year, eventually being brought over to America for the 1985 model year, meaning American builders will have to look for 1985 bikes and up. K100s from 1983 to 1988 will be the 2-valve per cylinder bikes, having changed to a more 4-valve set up for the 1989 model year and up until 1992. It was an upgrade borrowed from the Super Sport version of the K-Bike, the K1, which ran from uh, 1988 to the 1993 model years. Now, the K100 and the K1s are inline four models, but you have the choice of an inline triple with the K75, which ran from the 1985 model year to 1996, but that one never got the 4-valve upgrade, staying 2-valve for the entire run. To bring it back to the inline 4 bikes, the K1100 more or less replaced the upgraded 4-valve K100 in the early 90s with a displacement bump of 105 cc's maintaining the 4-valve setup. In 1996, the K1200 line saw its first trim level get released, now with a displacement of 1,171 cc's. They also used the same brick engine architecture, but the frame was completely different, it was ground up different. The 1200s eventually phased out the 1100s and ran up to the 2006 model year in a brick form before the K-Bike line jumped to traditionally mounted inline 4 and inline 6 engines, so really no need to mention those. Now, I know this is kind of confusing, or maybe it isn't, but it doesn't help that BMW is so weird when it comes to naming bikes, so let's just jump back and cover what you get with each model compared to the next. Now, I'd like to make it clear that 8-valve bikes are 2-valve per cylinder and 16-valve bikes are 4-valve per cylinder, but I might be using those interchangeably, so it might seem trivial but I don't want any confusion, all right? So, A-Valve K100. All European models have the quote-unquote hot cams, meaning they all make the claimed 90 horsepower at the crank. Many first-year 1985 US models, except for California bikes due to emissions, receive the same European cams and thus are the most desired year of the A-Valve K100 in the US. After that, all US models received the California cams, which means that the whole country lost about five ponies. So with the shaft drive system t uh, sapping away close to 20 horses, you're probably putting down 70 something horses to the actual pavement. The K75 was rated at 75 horsepower and is likely putting somewhere around 50 to the pavement since the you know drivetrain is the exact same. With the two valve per cylinder models, so the eight valve K100 and all K75s, your fueling is controlled by the Bosch Jetronic fuel injection system, which is commonly accepted to be the inferior system when compared to the Motronic system that comes with all the later four valve K bikes. For the purposes of a build, the Jetronic system definitely limits you in terms of what kind of intake setup you want to run due to the mass airflow sensor being used as opposed to metering uh, air at each cylinder bank individually like the later Motronic system does. You cannot ditch the big plastic plenum and the air sensor to run individual pods on a 8-valve uh, K-Bike unless you want to go through the trouble of setting up an aftermarket EFI system like, you know, Mega Squirt or something like that. But at that point, you're better off just getting a 16-valve model for the extra 10 horsepower. Now, I've seen some people change the plenum, but you're still going to need a plenum with Jetronic. Motronic in all applications was only applied to 16-valve heads, so rigging it up to an 8-valve head probably wouldn't work, although, you know, knowing knowing these guys they probably found a way to do it i personally i personally don't like the look of four pods on a k-bike but if i had fabrication skills i would have made a metal plenum into the mass airflow sensor for my bike now if you see individual throttle bodies on a k-bike odds are it's a 16 valve bike and you can tell if it's a 16 valve at a glance without knowing the year just by looking at the valve cover it looks a little bit more modern but it loses out on that simple vintage style so i definitely prefer the older one now you could fit a 16 valve brick into an eight valve frame if you wanted to but you also need to swap the jetronic to a motronic your bike may also come with ABS, but I, I trust you'll just delete that crap. 
Now, eight valve bikes also have the monolever rear drive system as opposed to the paralever system of the 16 valve bikes. Paralever system is basically it uses strut bar linkages and like clever geometry to, re to reduce the, the shaft jack effect that you get on shaft drive bikes. Now, on a normal bike with a chain or a belt, you, when you give it the beans, the rear end will squat. The front end will lift and you know it feels natural that's what you would expect to happen but with a shaft driven bike the rear will lift <laughs> along with the front so the bike just kind of perks up my bike is an a valve and thus it, it has the mono lever set up so when i really get on it the bike just whoop, jumps up which affects traction affects handling but you know it's all part of the game but what this also means is that the infamous splines of the mono lever bikes tend to wear faster than those on paralever bikes because of all that movement and pressure and you can actually convert an eight valve bike to a paralever but you'll need a pair, a pair of lever final drive, a swing arm, strut, drive shaft, shock, and a full transmission from a 16 valve K bike because the eight valve uh, transmissions don't have the mounts for that second that second lever, basically. Now, once you have all that, it's literally a bolt on job. I mean, all these things mount up really easily. The 16 valve bikes also have better suspension and wider wheels, which allow for modern radial tires versus old tall walled bias ply tires. Suppose you're looking to run radials on your old A valve K bike like I was, you know, for the front, it's going to be a little bit, it's going to be a little more difficult to run wider wheels on stock forks because you only have so much clearance up there. If you do a complete front end swap, you eliminate that problem with no machining or fabbing. Front end swaps to a more modern bike can be done easily using a Cognito Moto Triple Tree conversion kit. Now you can either go for a GSXR specific kit since for some reason those are the most popular for swaps and thus are cheaper. Or you could go for a, a kit that allows you to graft any front end to any frame for a little bit more money. Now, if you're strapped for cash, you can also just buy the conversion stem and press that into the donut triple tree. So I'm running a GSXR front end with a 30 millimeter offset Cognito Moto triple tree. And 30 millimeters of offset is what Cognito recommends for the use with a 17 inch GSXR wheel. Now the forks will still slap the tank. So unless you want to experiment with a higher offset level to see how the clearances are, you're going to have to address that tank slap. Now, you could limit the steering radius. Hell, you could take a mallet to the, to the little points at the front of the tank to smush them in a little bit. But the option I chose was just to move the tank mounts back and no more slap. A viewer by the name of Jordan recently brought to my attention that Cognito Moto also makes a kit that allows you to adapt any BMW front wheel to GSXR forks, which is honestly brilliant if you want USD forks, but also old style wheels. You can also just adapt a four valve complete front end if you want to run radial tires but you still want conventional right side up forks. Rear wheels, on the other hand, are much easier to adapt a later wheel to an eight valve. You can even, you can even swap a rear wheel from a single sided R bike onto K bikes. They literally just bolt on if it's the same four bolt pattern. So you can run a later model three by 17 wheel to run 150 width tires, or if you wanna get the big boy option like me and run a 4.5 by 18 B wheel for a 160 width tire, 17 front and 18 rear will pitch the bike forward making it feel more aggressive but unfortunately running an 18 inch rear wheel means you'll be limiting your tire selection in comparison to the more common 17 inch wheel the clearance with the swing arm is you know just uh when you're running a 4.5 wheel in a 160 width tire man you could get away with the two millimeter spacer that comes with the old k100s or you could source a later three millimeter spacer to move the wheel out a little bit more. Now, I'm running an 18 inch wheel with a fat 160 width radial tire, and I haven't noticed any crab walking or center line issues with the bike. And that's understandable because BMW does allow for some uh, some deviation. You will have to remove your center stand if you want to run a 4.5 or, or you know swap it for a four valve center stand from something like a K1100 if you really need a center stand, but you can't use the original. So when you get your bike, you can choose between the snowflake style wheel, the three spoke wheel, so long as you note that there's uh, a and B variants for, for the three spoke that have different specifications. And now I'm running the B variant from an R1100 bike. It's also the fancy five spoke star wheel from the K1200 and the Y spoke wheel from the R1100 GS models, which only requires a little bit of modification and a caliper change. You have quite a few options. Really the hard part is just making a front wheel match. So you kind of have to think a little bit hard about that one. Now let's talk engine swaps. I already mentioned that you could swap a 16 valve 1000 brick into your A valve frame. But you can also swap an 1100cc brick into it and even a 1200cc if you really want that 130 horsepower. Now as with all of them, you still gotta swap over the, uh, the Motronic uh, fuel injection system because Jettronic isn't gonna work. The 1100 will need the harness from the donor bike and the running gear, ideally since the running gear for the 1100s and the 1200s is stronger. And the 1200 will need to be like, like a strange combination of 1100 and 1200 parts due to the strength differences. So basically, you'll be running a 1200cc brick with a 1100cc uh, transmission and 1100cc clutch and also like obviously the um, swing arm and the final drive but 
basically you can't run like a like an eight valve uh, transmission to a 1200 because that's just too much power for it now if you want to graph the 1200 cc uh brick into your eight your 1000 cc frame it's definitely doable and i've linked a successful write-up on what it takes to do it now trim levels include the rs for sport touring t rt or lt for big comfy touring with the acronym depending on the model and the year and you also have the naked models for no fairings whatsoever essentially it doesn't really matter which one you buy if you're going to build one if you buy an lt model over a naked model well basically that just means you have more old parts to flip on ebay for project money you know later models also had higher output alternators so if your bike has a 33 amp one if you want to run heavy electronics you could get a 50 or 60 amp one swapped in you know if you want to run a bunch of lights or what have you now you have some small changes and improvements as the bikes go along but that's pre that pretty much sums up like the main compatibilities but there is an elephant in the room and i believe we must address that when it comes to building a k-bike and that's the droopy frame out back with the little kick up for the suspension mounting point you know in comparison with the tank the truth is K-bikes are ugly. I mean, they don't really support the design ethos of a cafe racer or Brad or Scrambler at all, you know, when you get right down to it. See, you look at a, a cafe style bike and the biggest feature is that straight line from the gas tank to the seat to the end of the bike. You can factor in other lines around the bike that match up, but the biggest one is that matching line from the tank to the seat. And it's great because bikes from the 70s have that straight line out of the factory. You know, just shorten the tail, put a hoop on it and done. But the problem is that the K-Bikes are in some kind of middle ground between vintage bikes of the like the 60s and the 70s and the modern bikes of the 90s and the 2000s. So, so you get this gas tank that has this line that goes up and then the seat drops. And it, it, honestly, it doesn't really work that well. So really you have three choices. Number one, cut the frame behind the shock and create a seat that fixes that issue of the broken line. So essentially you could kind of mask that issue of that weird frame line by simply running a seat that lines up with the tank so the frame might not might not necessarily line up with it but if the, the seat is made in, in such a way that it lines up with the tank or at least close enough you know it'll work pretty well this option is definitely the easiest because you can actually find aftermarket seats that are made to do this exact thing and you don't have to really cut your frame too much just cut that uh, that rear part off and just get a tail hoop you can probably find a tail hoop online next option is to redesign a subframe yourself from the ground up basically a full fabrication job which is easily the most involved option but with enough work or money you'll end up with something that's exactly what you want i've seen some bikes where extra tubing was simply added to the top of the existing subframe which allows for the stock suspension mounts to remain but i've also seen bikes with completely new mountain locations the final option is to use the retrorize kit which is naturally my favorite option because that's the option i went with it really cleans up the rear of the bike and makes it as short as possible plus that shock linkage is just undeniably cool. If you go with the retro rides route, here's a few things to consider. If you buy the, the, the kit pre-machined, make sure you also buy the Bible from retro rides. Here's how it works, right? If you buy the Bible, you get the plans to go to a machine shop to have them machine it for you, which will probably, well, not even probably, I know it'll be cheaper, but you can also buy it pre-made from Cafe 4 Racer. So if you get it pre-made, you're gonna have to buy the Bible anyway, because there's a lot of little instructions that you'll need to know, you know, for like, for example, like measurements, angles, tips and tricks, etc you know you're hacking up your frame so this is definitely something that you want to do correctly now since you have to cross br cross brace your frame it'll stiffen up the chassis and improve handling but it'll, it'll also make maintenance a little bit tough because you have to kind of lift the frame to get to the alternator kind of have to hit the hit the frame with a mallet to take it off or or put it back on because it's just so much more stiff but you know what you take the good with the bad and no matter what route you choose your bike will definitely look better for it so now you have a vague idea of what wheels you want to run or front end you want to run how you would like to address the frame, you know, your options for running gear swaps, engine swaps, etc. But when you roll that K-Bike into your workspace, what should you do first? If you bought the world's biggest turd that sat for some time like I did, you should probably get to cleaning that thing. Luckily, K-Bikes are the absolute easiest bikes to take apart because they are just glorified Lego bikes. I mean, really, what you have is a miniaturized running gear of a 1980s car, you know, with the motorcycle frame slopped on the top of it. So even though I struggled to recommend K-Bikes as a first build, it is definitely like comically easy to take apart. <laughs> I mean, you could easily do this with a repair manual, some forum searches, and some YouTube videos, including mine. <laughs> and take it apart, you absolutely should. And the great thing about K-Bikes is that even though they're super cheap to buy on a used market compared to like the more desirable R bikes, they are still old BMWs and people are still trying very hard to keep them on the road. So the parts that you pull off a K-Bike will likely go very quick and also for more money than you would expect. I mean, my bike was in poor condition, but I made decent money even with lowball prices, so I could imagine if you have a nice bike and you go to sell what you don't need off of it. But really, the point I just made about expensive parts is a double-edged sword, because when you get under the skin of that bike, you'll likely find that it's in need of maintenance or in need of a few parts. And I've said it before, as of many others, but K-Bike owners really let these bikes rot, which doesn't help the seals, the plastics, 
or the rubber bits around the bike. If you get a bike that's up to date on maintenance, you really should understand just how much money and time you'll save on maintenance. When you go to check out a K-Bike, I recommend that you ask about the clutch and the transmission splines. Hell, Chris Harris and all his wisdom recommends that you ask to check those splines on the spot, but I'm not sure if a seller would really let you wrench on his bike. There's also the final drive splines to check as well. If you don't properly grease all of these splines, they could eventually wear and then fail. Assuming you'll be looking at bikes older than the K1200, I would ask about the oil and water pump because BMW went with an absolutely garbage design for the first line of pumps. That's why when you rebuild an older pump, you have to retrofit so many updated parts and it's really not that cheap. If they tell you that they haven't rebuilt the pump, be prepared because those seals go super bad. If the owner has no idea, then you could drain the coolant and remove the, the cover at the front and check to see if it's a newer style impeller. If it's the old style, a cheaper and faster route to, you know, compared to rebuilding the, the pump fully would just be to source a good used K1200 pump and just slap it on there as is, as it has the improved design and seals and all that stuff from the start. I would ask if there's any starter sprag clutch issues because the K100 has this rare but still present issue where sometimes the starter clutch will not engage the crankshaft. This causes the starter to like spin in place without turning the engine over. You could generally fix this issue without having to dig really too far if you rock the bike and gear and like, you know, all these different remedies. Now I solved it by running better suited oil in Rhizolo, but if that doesn't work then you'll have to remove the bell housing and get up in there. You can find a guide in the description. See Briggs are a pretty robust engine, but the problem is that everything around them really isn't. Naturally the rubber and the plastic bits even more so after 30 odd years in some cases. Now the main sources that I used for OEM parts while I built my bike was eBay, just for uh, simple second hand parts but also Max BMW, which is a tri-state BMW dealer with pretty much the best parts catalog on this side of the US. But as a BMW dealer, they charge BMW prices. And an alternative is Euromoto Electrics, and it's invaluable because not only do they sell some BMW OEM parts, but they also do sell some cheaper alternatives produced by them or original reman parts. Generally speaking, their prices are always cheaper than BMW, and they're great with shipping. If I need a part and I see that EME stocks it, I always purchase it from them over Max because I can reasonably assume that I'll get it faster. If you don't see the part that you need on their site, you should probably go check their eBay page. For more obscure parts that people often you know, don't need and thus EME doesn't stock, you have to go through BMW though. And sometimes they'll even have to source the part from Germany. Now luckily Max has expressed shipping from Germany in those cases. Now if you're outside of the US, I'm naturally not sure what your best sources would be for, for OEM parts. Also some people swear by be, uh, be my boneyard, but I never had any luck with that myself. So you clean up the bike. You know what you're gonna keep, you, you have a pile of parts on the side that you wanna sell, and now it's time to simply do the maintenance because your bike was neglected, which seems to be more common than not according to my source. Expect to do jobs like compression tests, water and oil pump, oil and cooling change, spark plug changes, clutch work, rear seal, engine cover seals and gaskets, all the rubber bits around the throttle bodies like the breather, the manifold inlets, bushings because you know those crack and leak which you've seen with my bike which will make the bike backfire like a pistol and believe me that gets old quick. Then you got all the bits inside the tank like the fuel pump vibration damper, uh, screen, fuel lines, filter sender and then the fuel stuff outside the tank you know more lines, fuel pressure regulator and the injectors themselves. I pretty much had to replace all of that stuff temperature sender and whole sensor unit goes bad often and it makes the bike do dumb stuff and sometimes one of the two brains will go dumb and start doing weird things too. Now you'll find in typical BMW fashion that there's way too many specific tools for specific jobs and those things are hard to find now. So as I mentioned the cost of these parts are much more than you'd ever expect, much more than I ever expected but these are all things that have to be done. You may very quickly realize that a good chunk of the bill for your bike simply uh, simply came from maintenance jobs and not even customization because holy hell dude BMW values your soul to equal like three rubber grommets. You really really want your air, your fuel and your ignition system to be up to spec because your ignition system is pretty archaic. I mean people were telling me like you should get a tune, and, like you should get a computer and all of it. Like this is this is like really 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 Flintstones fuel injection. I mean, you can't, you cannot really do any of that unless you just swap it. Especially Jettronic, oh, forget about it. Because, because the thing is, it's, it's like resistor resistance based, so it will just listen to whatever, whatever input it's getting. So, like, you know, from things like the airflow meter, the throttle sensor, the temperature sensor, and the hall sensor. Now, now, if your temp sensor is bad, for example, it'll just tell the brain that the bike is cold all the time. You know, that's just one way for it to go bad. Oh, the, the engine is cold all the time, even when it's hot. So this will make the brain shove way too much fuel 24 seven, you know, as if you just started the engine, as if it's trying to run rich to get the engine to heat up. 
So maybe it'll tell the brain that the water is too hot, which causes the bike to literally not start to save the engine as a fail safe. Now, as you saw, it took a lot of futzing and sealing around with the air fuel and spark to make sure that the engine ran good. Just learn from me and don't touch those painted butterfly screws unless you really, really know what you're doing. You only have to touch the brass screws when it comes to sinking the throttle body. Now with the K-Bike, the fuel pump sucks fuel through a screen, sends it through another filter and down into the fuel rail to all four injectors. But the other end of the fuel rail runs into a pressure regulator, which sends excess fuel back into the tank, keeping the whole system pressurized at a specific level. And look, this fuel injector system still scares me. If this bike was carbureted, I'd have taken this thing upstate if you asked me to. But with so many things to go wrong, I have to keep doing these little shakedown rides to really make sure that, you know, above all, my wiring job is okay and that the injection circuit is as reliable as I hope it is. As a funny side note, under the recommendation of Ditstang, the K-Bike builder, I'm not even running the throttle position sensor. Overall, I haven't been disappointed in how this bike runs at all. I mean, it's, it's been doing great other than, you know, I mean, the kickstand doesn't have anything to do with how it's running. I'll leave a link to a troubleshooting guide for the Jetronic or 8-valve injection system, as well as a manual for it as well. I'll also link a manual for the 16-valve Motronic system, but I couldn't find a troubleshooting guide for that one. I think it's the same idea, though. It's a pretty good idea to understand how these systems work, because if something goes wrong, you'll be able to diagnose the issue and fix it accordingly. But I especially think that you'll need to know how the system works if you have any hopes doing the M-Unit rewire. Now, this is definitely a more rare direction from what I've seen on K-Bikes, but I think it's a worthwhile decision to run an M-Unit because if you look at the electrical harness of a K-Bike, it's absolute madness. I mean, to the point where the relays and the fuses need a totally separate and ugly plastic box. The thing about this harness is that there's so many interdependencies around the harness and it's definitely a little bit daunting to look at and kind of annoying to keep around, honestly. So your options are to leave it alone. I mean, the harness does its job. It's not graceful, but it does work. If you want to at least change the dashboard and update some of the lighting around the bike, you could run the BEP 3.0 lunchbox replacement unit, which doesn't get rid of your relays or anything like that. But it essentially dishes the giant archaic lunchbox dashboard and converts all its functions to a more modern format, so to speak. But to remove all the relays and fuses and truly simplify the harness, as well as get rid of that ugly giant box, you need an M unit. Now, I made an hour long video dedicated to how to get the bike running with an M unit, and Mikey from Pia has made a wiring diagram in several videos to guide you through it. So really, if you want to run an M unit and dump a ton of electric weight, then really there's no reason why you can't with this much info at your disposal. It's tricky, but it's doable, and it opens your bike up to custom controls and all that. I've also seen some people use like a pod filter to repurpose the airbox as a relay box above the engine, but Personally, I like the hollowed out look. So my bike has this huge hole over the engine and under the tank, you know, you can see right through the bike. You could run a pod filter on your eight valve airflow meter by using a pod filter adapter of the appropriate size. To match with the increased airflow, you can also run four hole injectors, which apparently have better fueling characteristics, but you should research that. By the way, be careful buying injectors. I've seen some Ford injectors get marketed as a K bike compatible, but they didn't fit my bike for whatever reason. Now I've replaced nearly every part of my air fuel and ignition system and I have two backup brains for troubleshooting on top of how easy the M unit makes it to troubleshoot to begin with. Now I already covered eBay, Max, and Euromoto Electrics as three good sources for parts, but what about custom parts? Well, I'd have to recommend eBay a second time as that's where I purchased a few things, but there's also Cafe Racer Web Shop, which has a fair share of K-Bike parts. Cafe 4 Racer, which also has a huge share of K-Bike parts, and BSK Speedworks, which is actually a racing team that puts out racing parts that they build for K-Bikes onto the streets. There you can find things like racing clutches, exhausts, rear sets, dampers, uh, radiators, billet or carbon throttle body stacks, race cams, ported heads, standalone advanced racing ECUs, and even completely rebuilt engines. Now with their mods, your brick can easily hit 200 horsepower, but not without some serious cash being dropped. Hell, this is unrelated, but there's actually some old turbo kits floating around for K-Bikes if you fancy forced induction. I'll leave info for that below. In fact, I'll leave a lot of different sources below, so if you really want some good sources, make sure you check the description. So with all that said, would I do it again? No, well, sorta. See, well, I, I mean, I'm totally glad that I built this bike. I mean, it's a real doozy of a bike. And it's cool to have such a unique bike, but I gotta say that building a K-Bike as a very first build turned out to be more of a power move than I thought. I mean, Really, you have uh, expensive and less common parts, weird architecture, common points of failure, and less community information, which are all literally the opposite of building any vintage Japanese bike. But here's my thought process for the build, right? I personally think that K bikes are not very attractive, so I had to turn my K100 into something I absolutely love the look of, no questions asked. I had to build the bike that I wanted to build. And to be honest with you, I rarely cut any quarters. I mean, the only corner I really cut 
was the exhaust and really that's for the for the better because there's not much space under there for two for two exhaust pipes anyway you know i never sketched out the final design for this bike but i definitely know what my ideal k100 looked like and there was no reason to stop anywhere short of that in a sentence I built this bike as if it were my fifth build, not my first. My resources are not the best, and most of you point that out, and I knew that going into it, but this bike was going to reflect on me positively no matter what. So really, my wariness comes from the fact that I could have built a CB, for example, or something like that for half the price of what I built this for, and I would have also loved the look of that as well, and they need less attention to make them look that great. Does that make sense? It's funny that I say that, but I swear, every time I look at this bike or I throw a leg over it, I can't think of having built any other bike. A K-Bike is an experience, and believe me, I definitely recommend it. Having recollected everything for this essay makes me look fondly upon the experience that I gained from the build. If you really want to build a K-Bike, and it's your first build, you absolutely should. I've shown you even despite the difficulty that is possible, even with limited knowledge and resources. I've told you, as a bit of a scrub myself, some of the resources and things to know, etc. But next time, I will let you know the cost of it all. Well, I hope this extra bit of info helps out any potential builders. I'm really stuck on this outro because I'm fully expecting myself to realize that I forgot to mention something later on even after a 13 page script. <laughs> if anything, like I said, I assume that you've watched this having seen or will plan to watch the rest of the build series. That's why I've, I've numbered this video with the rest. Now, I can't lie, I went back and forth with the idea of combining this with some of the final topics. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to combine the cost of psychology, capturing and conclusion into one single video. And that's definitely doable. Anyway, you just watch the illustrator and I'll see you on the next one.